scriptures talk about a blessedness that happens to a man whose delight is in the law of God. So as someone says, it says, but his delight is in the law of God. And doth he meditate day and night. He says that that man is like a tree planted by the rivers of water, whose leaves do not wither, when he bears fruit in every season. As you are about listening to this message, we believe that your life is going to be like that man planted by the rivers of water. Your leaves are forever going to bear. And we know that your, your season will not pass by. You will forever shine and you will forever bear fruit. We have a lot of content to share with you. So we would entreat you to subscribe to this channel as well as like us. Hit that notification bell to receive more updates from us because we know that whatever content here is going to set you on calls at every time. It's going to make you attain whatever stature that Christ wants you to attain. Thank you. Talk to the Lord in one minute. Speak to me, O oh God. Speak to my life. Speak to my destiny. The entrance of your word gives light and understanding unto the simple. Ask him for a visitation. Ask him for a very strong visitation upon your spirit, man. Father, give us strong visitations this morning. Are you praying? The Bible says, Ye have not because ye ask not. So for everyone that asketh, the Bible says, He receiveth. He that told you have asked for nothing, He says, Ask and you shall receive that your joy might be full. For in Jesus mighty name we have prayed holy spirit we pray that you breathe upon us breathe upon the word let it produce light and understanding unto our spirits and we pray that this session will be mighty upon us as far as transformation is concerned visit us so greatly and be glorified in jesus matchless name we have prayed god bless you please be seated So we began yesterday discussing the role of light as far as the empowerment of the saints is concerned. We examined a few things yesterday and we said that it is the desire of God as revealed in scripture that number one, all men be saved and then that after they are saved through Jesus Christ that they come into the knowledge of the truth. And we did agree yesterday that the stability of the believer is predicated upon his access to light, high level spiritual illumination. We said to have light alone is not sufficient. You must have light to the degree that can drive away darkness. Hallelujah. And um, I did tell us yesterday, just a quick recap, that light in scripture expresses three things. One, knowledge, remember? Two, manifestation. In fact, the Bible defines light as that which makes manifest. And then number three, glory. It says, arise, shine, for your light is come and the glory of the Lord. So light is connected to glory. Hallelujah. And I said that dominion in any area is a function of sufficient light. You do not walk practically in dominion over elemental forces, over the vicissitudes of life, commanding your reality. It will only happen at the instance of light. One more thing I said yesterday is that no matter how long darkness has been, it does not matter when light comes. Remember my example yesterday? So if a room has been dark for decades, years, months, weeks, 
days, hours, maybe minutes. The moment you switch on your light, if it is light indeed, it drives darkness instantly without discussion. John 1, 5. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Hallelujah. And I told us we must press for knowledge. Knowledge that gives us true dominion in this kingdom. So that we're not just professing Christians. We're not just Christians who potentially have the life of God and yet cannot demonstrate it but that we must translate the kingdom experience from prophecy from potential to experience jesus was speaking to nicodemus in john 3 when you read 2 to 5 he says except ye be born again you cannot see the kingdom then he now says in verse 5 except ye be born of water and of the spirit he says ye cannot enter now this is the experience of the kingdom where you can taste and see that the lord is good and by the way i hope you know that the dominion of the saints is how jesus is glorified hallelujah now in theology there's what we call the reflection principle no object glorifies itself it invests its glory in something outside of itself and the excellence of that which is outside itself is how the object is glorified. So the father does not glorify himself. The glory is invested in the son. The excellence of the son is how the father is glorified. The son does not glorify himself. He invests his glory in the church in partnership with the Holy Ghost. Are we together? So the excellence of the church is how the son is glorified. The church, the saints do not glorify themselves. It is their dominion over elemental forces, over principalities and powers. That is how the church is glorified. So the church in partnership with the Holy Spirit reveal and glorify the Son. And the Son brings glory to the Father. John 17, 1. Jesus lifted up his eyes to heaven to pray. And he said, Father, the hour is come. 17, 1 of John. He says, glorify thy son, that thy son may bring glory to you. 17 and verse 1, John. John 17 and verse 1. Glorify thy son, that thy son may glorify thee. Hallelujah. It's important that believers bear fruits. The Bible says in John 15 and verse 8, Herein is our Father glorified. When ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. John 15, 16, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Are we together? Ephesians 2, 10. It says we are his workmanship, recreated or created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God had preordained that we should walk in them. Ephesians 3.10 Paul was speaking to the church in Ephesus and he says to the intent that now unto principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold multifaceted wisdom of God. Hallelujah. John Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16 it says to permit your light to so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your father which is in heaven so the dominion of the saints is how god is glorified if you truly love the lord and you truly desire to see him glorified it will not just be by singing and dancing it will not just be by prayer you would want his life to find expression in and through you to the end that Jesus be glorified. Are we together? So, yesterday, I said how that every aspect of every result that we desire in the kingdom has a light component, a knowledge component that activates it. And I'll begin my teaching from there now. Years ago, I had a vision 
and the Lord would teach me this very practically and in that vision I was caught up in the spirit and I saw a giant gate an ancient gate and that gate was made up of smaller doors just like post office boxes and they were opening and closing as I watched opening many of them opening and closing and every time that small door opened light would emanate from it and on every of those small boxes were written scriptures and then the Holy Ghost told me that every scripture you see has a grace component behind it that empowers the saints to walk in the reality of it so every time you catch a revelation that light from that scripture enters you and you are now empowered to be a living epistle as far as that dimension of reality is concerned so prosperity in the kingdom has a body of knowledge that controls it longevity in the kingdom has a body of knowledge that controls it divine health and vitality has a body of knowledge that controls it impact and influence has a body of knowledge that controls it the assignment of the teaching priest like i said yesterday is to methodically teach and guide the saints from one mystery to another are we together now so that when you have been in church for a while you should literally surround yourself with the mysteries of the kingdom like chariots and therein lies your dominion that when you stand before any door you know how to open it you can live long you can walk in health you can walk in joy and vitality you can literally exert dominion over elemental forces over strange spirits that attempts to thwart the destinies of men and this is why we are here i told us yesterday that there are six dimensions of knowledge six dimensions of light that every believer must access to be relevant as a witness to be relevant as an ambassador to be relevant as light and as salt hallelujah by the way maybe it may interest you let me just state this very quickly and then we'll finish where we left off that believers are classified in scripture in twofold there is our classification based on identity then there is our classification based on function and assignment don't forget that when the bible classifies believers we are classified twofold number one based on our identity so jesus says i am the vine is that true and then he says we are branches so that is classification based on identity for instance we are called heirs of god and joint heirs with christ the purpose of that classification is to help us understand the extent of our oneness ephesians 6 verse 10 it says finally brethren be strong in the lord in fact when you read from amplified i wish we could get amplified of that scripture it says draw your strength from your union with him so that your strength is derived be empowered from your union with him the consciousness of your oneness with him are we together the branch never struggles to get nutrients from the ground because it is connected to the vine connected to the root so believers are classified based on identity but believers are classified based on function so we use these words like you are light you are salt you are ambassadors acts 1 8 you are witnesses unto me you are kings and priests revelations 5 10 all of these classifications attempt to describe our assignments not just our oneness but our function hallelujah so back to the five dimensions of knowledge number one yesterday we said the first dimension of knowledge that the believer must access light indeed is that you must know god and his son jesus christ are we together very important number two we said you must know yourself in light of who christ is your identity in christ is a major requirement if you must walk in the experience of victory 
Number three, we said you must know yourself in God's program and in destiny. Your prophetic place as far as God's program is concerned. This will be the cure for complex inferiority, jealousy, pain, anger, and all those petty flesh attributes that they are literally cured when you find your place in God's program. Number four, we said you must understand the mysteries and the principles of the kingdom. Did you write that down yesterday? Yes. That you literally excel in the kingdom when you have an understanding of the mysteries, the modus operandi of the kingdom. Before Moses would cry for the glory of God, he said, show me your ways. And then later on, he would say, show me your glory. Hallelujah. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16 encourages us to stand in the way. It says, and see and ask for the old path, wherein is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your soul. So there is a way that leads to life, and there is a way that leads to destruction. In fact, the Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto a man. It is not right, but it seemeth right. We don't know how long it can seem right. It can seem right for 20 years of your life, only to find out you were wasting your time. It says, but the end thereof are the ways of destruction. Let's do number five now. Continuing from where we left off yesterday. Number five, what is the fifth kind of light that every believer who desires to do business with God in this end time must contend for? Are you ready? You must understand man as the zenith of God's creation. Just write this one and please listen carefully. You must understand man, M-A-N, man as the zenith of God's creation. Can I tell you? In all your learning and in all your knowledge, if you do not understand man, you will live a defeated life as far as the cosmos is concerned. You must know God, you must know yourself, but you must understand the world of men. Two scriptures, Psalm 8, 1 to 6, a scripture that has blessed me for so many years. O Lord our God, how excellent is thy name in all the earth who has set the glory above the heavens reading to verse 6 out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast ordained strength because of thine enemies that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger verse 3 when i consider the heavens the work of thy fingers the moon the stars which thou hast ordained what is man that thou art mindful of him nor the son of man that thou visitest him. Keep four. We're going back to four, please. And then we'll do five. Just go back to four. What is man? The psalmist is asking a question. He's saying, I have considered all the works that you have created, but none of your creation commands your jealousy and attention like man. So what is in man that is not in plants? What is in man that is not in the sea? Why are you so at to man when plants fade you leave them to go and another season comes but when man falls you are quick to send a prophet what is in man is it that you put something in man that even men do not know what is man that thou art mindful are you not so powerful why do you come you see the nation of israel would walk against the ways of god and they usually would be given to their enemies now in slavery and servitude and pain and loss and despair they will cry unto god and here he comes again god was not ashamed to demonstrate his vulnerability towards man so the psalmist studied this and said no there has to be something about this man is it that you cannot wipe them away and create a new race of obedient people? Remove their will and let them be a species of totally obedient people. How come the same man, you will bless them, they will sin against you, walk against your ways and go to worship other gods and say, God, we are not interested in you. And God will say, okay, fine. After a while, by himself, he will now look for a prophet and say, talk to these people. I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with my loving kindness. 
Are we learning now? What is in man that makes God so vulnerable as though he's lost his power? That God sits in the heaven and all he's thinking about is man. It's in your Bible. The Bible reveals the thoughts of God. How could such a mighty God, the monarch of the universe, he's not thinking about any plan whatsoever. He sent Jesus because of man, created things because of man, fought Satan because of man. Jesus is at the right hand interceding because of man. Everything in heaven because of man. What is man? If God is asking that question, you better ask it too. What is man? That means there is something deeply mysterious about man. Hallelujah. In a teaching series called Let Them Have Dominion, I taught about what the condition it takes to be a man. Because not everybody is man. Not everyone on earth can be called man. There are three conditions, and that's not my teaching, but there are three conditions for you to be called man. Not everybody is man. That is why redemption is not for everybody. Angels are not men. They can't be saved. Are we together? For you to be a man, you first have to be a spirit. If you are not a spirit, you can't be a man. Number two, that spirit must reside within a mortal body. If that spirit is not trapped within a mortal body, it cannot be called man. Then that spirit must have the solical faculties of the will, emotion, and intellect operating at the same time. That tripartite reality is what turns that species to be called man. Hallelujah. So when the Bible says, what is man? that thou art mindful of. You can't call a fish a man. You can't call a dog a man. There are animals that look like men, but they are not men. Are we together? Animals can be trained to be so intelligent. I mean, science has gone so far. They train animals. Some of them can almost talk. So intelligent. They understand languages. You go, our military people across the globe have trained dogs. They have trained all kinds of animals. They have extracted and stretched their intelligence, but they are not men. As simple and frail as man is, he has created a metallic object that can fly 35, 40,000 feet above sea level and to transport him from one place to the other. The great oil mines, the great mansions across the globe were not made by animals. They were made by men. This mic that I'm using to amplify my voice was the creativity of man. The only reason why money is important is because there are men, not animals. Take away all the men in the world and open all the banks. Let you be the only one who is alive. Everything only finds its relevance because there are men. Unfortunately, believers do not study men. And this is why we fail so woefully. It is important to know God. But it is important also, not equally important, but important to know man. So the fifth kind of light you must contend for is you must understand man as the zenith of God's creation. Second scripture. Did we finish that scripture by the way? Let's finish it. Psalm 8 4. What is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him? Verse 5. It says for thou hast made him a little lower than angels is the word Elohim. The word there is literally God. You have made him lower than God and crowned him with glory and honor. Let's read verse 6 together. One to read. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Uh -huh. And has put how many things? Under his feet. All things. Now Paul in quoting this scripture in Hebrews chapter 2. He adds a lot of life to this scripture. He says and in doing so he left nothing that was not put under his feet. Then he says but now we do not yet see all things under his feet. 
but sufficient for you to know that in God's mind and his economy, the highest, the zenith of his creation is man. As beautiful as the oceans are, wonderful oceans, rivers, and you have a lot of them here, and I can imagine the scenery. People spend millions of dollars to build vacation homes just to have access to that scenery. I remember years ago, where was that now? That should be Gambia. I was kept somewhere very, very beautiful, just like your region here. And I was kept somewhere just overseeing the ocean. And I said, oh Lord, I am safe in this place. No river, no ocean whatsoever comes to meet me here. I mean, the waters were getting boisterous. And I said, I hope these people are aware that there are homes just close to the seashore. <laughs> you know, you are sleeping in the night and that sound wakes you and you say, no, no, no. He shall keep his angels charge over me. <laughs> Hallelujah. But are we together now? Yes. He made him, he gave him dominion over all the works of his hands and put all things under your feet whether you walk in the experience of this truth or not does not change the fact that this is how god designed us to function today unfortunately we see that most of what should be under our feet is above us and we are slaves to creation and elemental forces this is why god has put this conference together one more scripture psalm 115 and verse 16 psalm 115 verse 16 psalm 115 115 and 16 psalm 115 and 16 psalm 115 thank you let's read together one to read the heaven even the heavens are the lord uh-huh but the earth hath he given to the children of men read the b part please but the earth has he given to the children of men one more time but the earth has he given to the children of men this scripture is so powerful that god himself made it scripturally wrong for him to invade the earth even though he's the creator outside of the corporation of man when it was time when god said let them have dominion that was a very implicating statement that means i will never do anything in the earth without the cooperation of one man not the permission the cooperation most people say the permission no god is still god but he requires the cooperation of man to the extent that jesus was delayed until God finally found a virgin willing to donate her womb for Jesus to arrive. If Mary refused, God would respect her will and have to start searching for another virgin because there was no prophecy in the Bible that the name of the virgin who will birth Emmanuel will be Mary. Mary simply partnered with prophecy. The same way there was no prophecy that the man to betray him will be called Judas. Judas saw that script and played to that script hallelujah are you learning now so the bible says the earth has he given to the children of men do you know what that means if you know god and you do not know men you will only enjoy spiritual blessings in heavenly places in christ but as far as the earth is concerned you will live such a defeated life and this is where when believers are not mentored to understand the cosmos you see they, we are spiritual, we can fall down, we can stand up, but as far as our excellence is concerned and kingdom advancement, we fail and we do so woefully. A few weeks ago, I was in your nation again to speak for the World Conference of the Full Gospel Businessmen Fellowship, and one of the teachings that I taught there was the wisdom of Egypt. The Bible tells us that even though Moses was a great spiritual man, he had to learn the wisdom of Egypt for him to reign. You notice every time God's people were reminded about the covenant, they would, you know, create monuments, altars, and, and then worship God. But every time God wanted to use them, he would send them to Egypt for their learning. That was true for Joseph. That was true for Moses. Are we together? Yeah. The wisdom of Egypt. 
most believers do not understand the wisdom of the cosmos so we fail in business we fail in politics we fail in every other aspect because there is no abundance of light we do not understand men and sometimes we make sincere mistakes like saying i don't need any man if you are saying that to describe the sovereign power of god you are right but if you are saying that as far as your work in the earth is concerned you will be learning a slow but painful lesson through the years you have left hallelujah even god needed men the problem of the man in john chapter 5 please give it to us john chapter 5 from verse 1 there was a man who was in a pool called bethesda let's go to verse 2 it says a a, a, a porch there bethesda having five porches verse 3 it says give us verse 3 media in this lay a great multitude of impotent folk of blind halt withered waiting for the movement of the water verse 4 now it says for an angel went down to a certain in a certain season to steer the pool trouble the water and whoever was the first to jump into was made whole of whatever disease he had now verse 5 and a certain man was there which had an infirmity how long 38 years this is one of the longest conditions we know that a man carried you know a man carried a problem a, a plague so long we don't know how long job's own lasted we know that abraham's own lasted for about 25 years now this man had 38 the bible says and when jesus saw him lie he knew that he had been now a long time in that case and he said unto him will thou be made whole listen to the man's problem verse 7 the impotent man answered him sir i have no man this is my problem it's not that i do not know where the healing is i am aware that there is that possibility but my limitation what has multiplied my pain and kept me here for 38 years is not the sickness the solution to it has all it comes every year but i have no man it is dangerous to be alone i have no man there are many many christians who have no man many churches who have no man once upon a time the apostle was afraid and god told him do not be afraid to go into the city because i have many people in the multitude of men is a king's honor no matter what you have if you do not have the advantage of men you are in trouble is someone learning now yes It takes men for men to rise. All blessings, you may have heard me say, comes from God through men to men. Let me say it again. All blessings come from God through men to men. Even salvation came from God through the man Jesus to men. Not through the God Jesus salvation came from god the father through the man jesus to men so if god says yes and men say no your yes remains yes only in the spirit as far as the physical realm is concerned your life will be full of no's for the rest of your life many of us are like this man i have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the man who was crippled who was healed at Jesus' crusade. He was not just healed because he was, he was um, um, most fortunate. He just had the opportunity of a few men who carried him and said, today you must be healed. And they tore the roof. It was no effort on his part. In fact, the Bible says when Jesus saw their fate, the man in this kingdom who hates you does not matter but who likes you matters it truly does vashti the king hates you and you cease becoming queen immediately esther the king likes you even as a village girl and you become queen immediately hallelujah the heaven of heavens belong to the lord but the earth has he given 
to the sons of men now most people do not understand this i wish i had all the time i would have shown you the dynamics of living in this cosmos because when god gave us the command be fruitful be fruitful means be relational everything multiplies fruitfulness is only through relationships biology teaches us that is that true the only exemption was mary and don't you think it was really an exemption it was just a human exemption but the holy ghost came to play that fatherly role everything multiplies when it is connected to something else except a corn of wheat relates with the ground by falling to it it abides it remains alone but if it now unites with the earth it can now produce so when you are in one of the ways that satan destroys people is that through ignorance or pride he isolates you from all the men that have been destined to hold your hands in fact one of the classic ways that satan destroys men is to cause you to fight with everybody who can be used to lift you when you are now alone and through offense your destiny helpers are far he will now strike you in pride and pain you will be alone we are only alone when we are seeking God in terms of encounters. When it has to do with our dominion, two are better than one. For they have a good reward for their labor. Is that in your Bible? That one chases a thousand. He never said two chase two thousand. Two will put ten thousand to flight. So imagine what ten will do. Men are so powerful that Jesus said, if any two shall agree, is the same God you are talking to but he said when two of you are now agreeing it creates an effect that even God will have to respond to Genesis 11 Nimrod Kush gathered men there was no Holy Ghost there there was no demon mentioned it was only men but because the men were united he said go to come let us make bricks and mortar and build a city whose top and whose tower will reach the heaven and the Bible says that God had to look down and to see the city which men had already built God himself had to come down and scatter them otherwise he said God was testifying give us verse 5 this is God testifying no mention of demons in that scripture no mention of the Holy Spirit in that scripture verse 5 11 and verse 5 and the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded look at verse 6 God is testifying and the Lord said behold the people is one not behold the person behold there are men who have come together in oneness and they have all one language and this they begin to do hear God's testimony about man and now nothing shall be restrained from them which they not him have imagined to do this is not an angel testifying this is the creator of the ends of the earth who knows what he put in man no wonder there is something you get in church that you cannot get no matter how consecrated how diligent you are there are dimensions of god you will never get in your secret place until you come into the corporate gathering of the saints for instance psalm 133 behold how good and how pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity it says it is like the oil verse 2 that comes from the head of aaron are we together and down to his bed to Aaron's skirt and down to his garment verse 3 he now says like the dew of Hermon and the dew that descended upon the mountain of Zion for there in that gathering the Lord had commanded the blessing even life forevermore hallelujah are we learning you must understand men ladies and gentlemen the answer to your prayer right now is in the hand of a man that is the truth that is the truth what you are praying about the lifting of joseph came from god but it was in the hand of pharaoh it was within his power and when pharaoh exercised that power he said i am pharaoh genesis chapter 41 chapter 40 40 chapter 41 i am pharaoh and except in the throne would you be higher than me but as far as administration is concerned you are in charge immediately gave him a signet ring decorated him with honor 
are we together now and gave him a name and then caused him to marry Potiphera the priest the daughter of Potiphera the priest of on honor came to him automatically in one moment how about King Nebuchadnezzar how look there are men who are so powerful you cannot cast them the only way God helps you is to grant you favor with them they are gatekeepers you can't pray them away the Bible says when a man's ways pleases the Lord he maketh his enemies there are some enemies you cannot cast away they are gatekeepers even God recognizes their authority he will grant you favor with them otherwise that door will be closed forever I hope you are learning because someone you are here ignoring your boss ignoring everybody and say what is there is it just because you are a millionaire and you are the one suffering you see believers need to have spiritual intelligence if you want to reign and dominate in the cosmos relationships are powerful the hardest currency on earth are relationships not dollars not pounds no that is poor education if you buy everything with money i taught you last year when i came here by the truth i taught you that if you use money to buy everything in your life wisdom is not at work in your life there are many things that should be written paid for by relationships <laughs> hallelujah Jesus is on his way to Golgotha, ladies and gentlemen. Your Jesus going to die not for his sin, for the sin of the world. And he had bled from the beating. The Bible tells us that he was so weak, he had lost strength because the life of the flesh is in the blood. He had lost so much strength, he fell down and they had to bring a man called Simon of Cyrene. Is that in your Bible? And he held the cross for Jesus. Jesus did not say, leave me. I am Savior. I will die alone. He needed that help. Otherwise, Jesus would have died on the ground. Watch this. If Jesus died on the ground, your sins will not be saved because it is written, curse is the one who hangs on a tree. He had to die on the tree, not on the ground. If Jesus died on the ground, it will not be mission accomplished. He had to die as a curse on a tree. For it is written, the Bible says, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree, that the blessings of Abraham, justification by faith, might come upon we the Gentiles, to the end that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That's what the Bible teaches. A man. How about the dead Jesus on the cross? That body was lying lifeless there. And nobody had the power and the influence to bring it down. No angel. Angels could roll away the stone. But they could not bring the body of Jesus down from the cross. It took a man of influence called Joseph of Arimathea. That man had a, he had a virgin tomb. It belonged to him. He had influence with the kings of the day. He said, give me the body of the man. And they brought Jesus. Otherwise without a man you would never say oh death where is your sting oh grave where would be the grave in the first place i want to show you the role that men played as powerful as jesus is and was when he was on earth there were three men that activated his destiny number one is called simon the serene a man called the prophet simon number two the second was called um, or Simeon the prophet I meant to say my apologies Simeon the prophet number two was Hannah the prophetess number three John the prophet who you call the Baptist these three men had to pray for Jesus and release him to excel the Holy Ghost never came until he honored these three men listen believers do not understand the power of men your media people ask me a question um, one brilliant gentleman who was interviewing me yesterday, he asked me a question and he said, Apostle, why are you back here again? I said, I'm back here because I love your pastor, because I believe what God is doing here and because I love Ghana. I do. It's true. Hallelujah. I was teasing them yesterday and I told them that I will get an affiliate citizenship. <laughs> hallelujah praise the name of the lord but you get my point don't
don't go around hating people and say it doesn't matter i know the holy spirit you will really suffer you will i assure you um, this is not a prophecy i'm telling you by wisdom don't go around pushing men you push your destiny helpers your divine connectors the men of influence in your life you push gifted people you push burden bearers and say it does not matter you will need to swallow your pride restore certain relationships swallow your pride listen listen to me when god in genesis chapter 12 are you learning am i wasting your time when god in genesis chapter 12 called abraham he was called alone he was called alone given all the blessings i will make your name great and lot just put his ears and said what is god telling this man and when he heard it abraham was about to go lord said no way god did not call me but i will follow the one god called and watch this when we get to genesis chapter 13 everything abraham had abraham had lord had to the extent you do not now know who god called and who followed because the blessings followed the one called and the one who was following now but there was problem the bible says contention rose against the men of abraham and the men of lot lot would have said guys don't be foolish you don't know what it took me to get this you better apologize to these people and maintain these relationships but lot was puffed up in pride and abraham said we be brethren let us not fight he said look around choose where you want because i know what is on me but you choose where you want and go anywhere that is left and Lot, the first decision he made outside of the partnership of Abraham took him to Sodom. That means that prosperity was not a reflection of his wisdom. It was a reflection of his relationship. <laughs> Hallelujah. He went to settle near Sodom. He didn't enter Sodom yet, but he was near Sodom. And Abraham said, okay. And when he left, the Lord now told Abraham, he said, don't worry. From where thou art, lift your eyes. Northwards, it was. Everywhere you have seen. Now, fast forward the passage of time. That guy was in the middle of Sodom already. About to tear his life and destiny. And then God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, you are my friend. Why does God come to a man again? He wants to destroy Sodom and he leaves heaven to come to the earth and looks for one man to say, Abraham, I cannot hide this from you. I'm about to destroy Sodom. And Abraham said, wait, I have an interest there. If there are 50 people, don't go yet. There is somebody who is stubborn and rebellious, but I still love him. I still love him. If there are 10 people, this is a man discussing with God. They are literally negotiating the destinies of men. I'm not teaching you human worship what is foolishness to ignore men to we live in a world today where in a bit to show i know that there may be you know we men of god who have subjugated men and turned it into slavery and made ourselves demigods that is wrong but in managing that tragedy don't throw the baby and the bath water you will be making a dangerous mistake god comes down and meets a man and says what do you think about it i'm about to destroy these guys do you know what it means for God to call a man your friend? It's like you calling an antelope my friend. I'm meaning it. You are saying, I'm about to build a, play, a house in Takoradi. Um, what do you think? That's what it takes for God to come down. And Abraham said, don't go yet. There is a man. And God sends two angels. Lot is there. There's sodomy. And although he's a righteous man, his wrong decisions have made him to a point he was going to lose his daughters. And these crazy people, when the angels came, they saw them, they wanted to sodomize them. And Lord said, don't bring this embarrassment. Take my daughters. And he said, we don't want the, these, these angels that we want. You can imagine the kind of people. And yet he was still living in the midst of them. He had the power to run away because he did leave that place. So why didn't he leave since? He remained in Sodom. And the Bible says, when the angels struck them with blindness, brought Lot inside and told him all the news, he sent him out and he was about to leave. That salvation did not just come because of angels alone. A man literally negotiated the salvation of Lot. Do you believe what I'm telling you? There are men who come to church 
with demons oppressing you you are singing the praise and worship you are hearing angels are hearing the demons are hearing yet they do not leave until a man mounts the pulpit all the spirits jesus drove in his crusades were there when he arrived yet they did not go the woman who was bound 18 years was there the spirits behind her were looking at jesus he was looking at them and they did not leave until he said woman thou art loose from your infirmity Do you believe what I'm teaching you? Men are so powerful that when Jesus resurrected, he gathered the same men, 120 of them, and said, Gentlemen, you are the ones who will frontier the course of this vision. Tarry ye until you be endued with power. Why didn't he say, Holy Ghost, go on your own in the earth, ignore men, just force people to be saved? No. Do you know that God has always intended to bless you even this year? But he needed a man to say yes. I hope you believe what I'm saying. So when we celebrate men, it is not human worship. What we do is we are acknowledging their partnership, the pain and the labor in the spirit, the sacrifice of alignment that has brought them to a point where indeed they can be called the friend of God. Hopefully one day when God grants us grace, we'll, we'll examine from scripture what it takes to be a friend of God. Because to be a friend of God is more than being a believer. Mm -mm. It's a status in the spirit called a friend of God. Not many people had that status. Please sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. Pray in the spirit for one minute. Harasanes kalebaratos ya. Holy, holy, blessed is he who comes in the name of our God. Blessed is he who comes. Just do what I ask you to do. Areka shalabagados. Holy, holy. Blessed is he who comes in the name of our God. Hosanna, Hosanna. Let it see who comes in the name of our God. Ha, Elohim. Ha, Elohim. Ha, Elohim. Ha, one minute pray in the spirit you are receiving as you are praying you are receiving as you are praying divine realities have been imported into your spirit one minute it's part of the conference pray Sana Shabas Kadala Kapraska de Velekata Branda Gavelekos Shevelega de Vekata Branda Gavala Kata Braka de Velekata Shabas Sabraska Bereta Kafra de Kabeleta Kaparua Sedesh Paranda Kafraska de Velekate Vreka de Velekate Mariata Shabakadaba Lakate Frenda Gaberekos Yata In Jesus' matchless name we have prayed. In Jesus' matchless name we have prayed. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, hear me. This revelation alone, if this is all you know, 
if this is the only light that comes it is not sufficient to make you rise to the zenith of your prophetic destiny but it sure will not keep you on the ground man man of god do not ignore the man god has given you alone you will be defeated as powerful as elijah is when he ran away from jezebel when god met him he said i am alone god said no it's only your pride that has made you believe you are alone there are seven thousand others who have not bad to bear there are many great men who do not have economic men to stand with them great preacher but broke and poor you cannot do much because god sent men to hold your hands and your pride push them away i don't need you i'm anointed there are men today who god has placed in politics and government in economy are we together in diplomatic circles that in partnership with those men your life becomes invincible upon the earth that if people want to strike you economically there are men who stand like the men of david to defend you when people want to come from political angles there are gatekeepers who said not at my watch when people want to strike you using diplomacy to stop your access to the nations there are men can i teach you something do not when you see people excel in life it's not only anointing no they are excelling is a composite of a network of strong men i hope you believe what i'm telling you yes. strong men there are men today whose signature can open doors is a master key even if it is on a piece of paper they can tear it and sign and say help as requested we'll talk later and you carry a paper you don't know the implication and someone is about to throw you out of an office so when god says i will favor you he's saying that because there are men in the system already who can partner with you hallelujah do you believe what i'm telling you you don't need too many men in your life but you need a few strategic ones let me list four of them for you very quickly number one you need divine connectors divine connectors are not powerful people they just know who is powerful divine connectors are like the slave girl the slave girl that was with nam um, with naman naman was a captain of the syrian army the bible says he was a valiant man in war but that could not cure him of his leprosy the entire journey that would lead him to elisha came as a result of the counsel of a young maid who attended to his wife divine connectors do not have the form and the fashion to be desired it takes humility and discernment your divine connector can be as we call it in nigeria a bus conductor your divine connector can be someone your cab driver you order an uber or a bolt and someone can be in that car listening to a man of god's message and your 20 minutes journey can be the beginning of knowing the grace that will help you divine connectors are powerful that is why if you only respect great people you will be in trouble because great people are enhanced and helped by supposedly average people when you see an office looking clean it's not the ceo that cleaned it there was someone who cleaned it and put things in place and that someone who cleaned it can choose to pull away your file and that's the end of it as small as he is he can stop a ceo from getting a contract respect great people but honor small people just for sake of description hallelujah there are people who only respect those who are rich anointed and great anybody who is your contemporary or below you you can kick them while you are honoring others it's hypocrisy the bible says honor all men and it says honor the king so you can see a little baby can even be your daughter playing all the time and one day she'll say mommy let's go to church that was the holy ghost speaking because something would happen in church that day that will redefine your life your gate man all the time can watch you and you say how are you sir but one day he'll say sir this is your sickness there's a man of god i know i don't know if you can talk to him and that can be your connection point 
Someone can be passing a flyer randomly and pass the flyer of a seminar that you may just collect, but that can be the answer to your prayer. The key to working with divine connectors is discernment. Always discern. As weak as they may look. Number two, men of influence. The second group of men that you need in your life are men of influence. Men of influence are men of timber and caliber. Through their sacrifices and for most of them, the dignity of kingdom integrity interplaying the laws of the kingdom and the laws of success have arisen to a point of notoriety and influence. Their endorsement, their referral, their recommendation to your life can redefine your possibilities. Hallelujah. The wine presser had a dream. Joseph interpreted it. There was no reward. The baker had a dream. Joseph interpreted it. There was no reward. But when the king had a dream, as soon as Joseph interpreted it, he became prime minister. Three men had dreams. Joseph interpreted three people's dreams. The problem was the status of the dreamers. Ah, when you interpret a king's dream, you don't remain in the prison again. So when God wants to lift you, he will not just send dreamers. He will send kings who are dreamers. He interpreted the dream of the wine presser. He interpreted the dream of the baker. But when he stood before the king, when the king was done talking, he said, Oh king, it's not about cows and it's not about plants. It's about the law of seasons. Something that will befall the earth. It has happened twice to me. It is established. And he spoke to the king. And look at his diplomacy. Let a king find a man so discreet and wise. In other words, king, I dare you, search round. If you will find a man like this. Are we together? When you serve kings, you never serve from the prison. They have the power to bring you out of the prison. The Bible says, and the king sent for him and they brought him out of his dungeon. There are people who are shouting and praying, Lord bless this family, take us out of shame and reproach. And one man in Ghana who even loves God can sign something for you and that would be it. Oh, the door of admission is closed. That is a relative statement. It depends on who is speaking. Let me tell you the truth. Law and order at every level and leadership and access and influence at every level is relative. If it takes men to write it, men can change it under certain conditions. Not every condition. You need men of influence who? You do. You do. They are gatekeepers. One person can come to you and look at you and endorse you and bring you to a place where you are lifted and elevated now politicians know this even though many of them do it in a very bad way unfortunately but most of them understand the power of relationships you may have heard it in my teaching why will a billionaire or a millionaire travel across kilometers to come and celebrate the birthday of a rich man's two-year-old son is he his mate why did he arrive there i mean come on please a man that told you you've been trying to get in touch with him he's told you i am busy yet you are watching tv and you are finding him and then a television station is recording the birthday with all the adverts waiting online they are recording the birthday of a two-year-old child playing around and pouring drink on the ground and you see very noble men nodding did they really come for the birthday <laughs> I'm not saying to go and run around the corridors of psychophants and people who are godless. There is order and we do it with discernment and caution. But by all means, you better begin to thank God when noble people come into your life. Even as a pastor, don't get into the pride of telling everyone, I don't care anybody. God brings a noble person, one like Joseph of Arimathea, and we throw them away and say it does not matter. They leave you with your frustration and go. They are the ones, and you find out that people are praying. Your answer comes to you and you do not know. You know they were praying for Peter to come out of the prison. In Acts chapter 12, 
when Peter came out of the prison and went to where believers were praying, they opened the door and saw him and closed it back. They said, no, it is his angel. This is the guy they were praying about. And yet he had come as an answer. And they closed the door again. They said, let's keep praying. Most believers keep praying, but when their answers come, they come in men and they do not know. The moment you start praying, start discerning the men who are coming. Because answers come embodied in men. Sit down, let's finish up. So number one, divine connectors. Two men of influence. Number three, gifted men. I was watching your media recap of my teaching yesterday and I just whispered to the bishop. I said, your media people are nice people. Their production, their, their intelligence for production is good. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, as a member of this church, you are happy. But were you the one who did that work? No. But you can share in your glory, in the glory of the, you know, the commendation. Why? Because of the presence of gifted men. Perhaps the men who did this now are nameless, faceless, somewhere doing their work. Gifted people are powerful. The greatest corporations on earth thrive well because they take out time to invest in bringing together the best minds. Gifted people are a blessing. Gifted people are a blessing. When God brings gifted people to your life spiritually, corporately, don't throw them away. Appreciate them. Gifted people are powerful. You don't appreciate your expert driver till you sit to be driven by one who doesn't know what he's doing. And may God help you that you don't know the scriptures that guarantee long life. Hallelujah. One time we were going to fly to where I can't remember and the weather was not good and we needed to get there because um, we couldn't disappoint the people. And so the captain told us, he said, okay, we're going to fly, but for whatever, any reason, just to let you know, if the weather gets too bad and we cannot land, we'll have to reverse back. We said, okay, fine, let's take the risk. And I got in there and that guy was so good. I watched the way he was maneuvering a very bad weather. I had already prepared. One thing I know, I will not die, number one. But then the convenience of bouncing like a ball in the air is not a very pleasant experience. Hallelujah. But that guy maneuvered his way. And when we arrived, I had to whisper to him. I said, you are very good. And he just smiled with the confidence of an expert. It's good to know something. Even if you don't know everything, be a master at something. It takes away shame and reproach. It truly does. <laughs> Hallelujah. Refuse to be average. Knowing many things, small, small, small. It's better to know something so good. It will give you a space in the table of the great. Number four, very quickly. The last group of men that you need are called burden bearers. I can spend all day teaching you on this. Burden bearers don't move you forward, but they stop you from going backward. These are men who love you for you. They don't love the gift. No. Their love for you is beyond being emoji, being a musician. They are the ones who will cry with you. They are the ones who will stand with you. They don't live with you. They die with you. Can I tell you, in your whole life, you will not find so many of these people, but I pray that you will find them in your life. Burden bearers are powerful people. When Jesus died, even his disciples before he would die, his disciples that loved him so much, they ran away, justifiably so. They didn't want to die. They ran away. But there was a woman who came to embalm him, to rub oil on him, remember? Yeah. She came and she found an empty tomb. She said, what is going on? She would take the risk to come and do that. What if she was killed? What if she was arrested? Burden bearers. They are not ashamed of carrying the scar to stand with you. They are not ashamed. They will cry with you. There are many great people today who have all the three except for the last. And when moments in their lives come that demand help, down times in their lives, they have nobody to stand with them. Nobody to stand with them. They can call you king of kings when it's a triumphant entry only because they ate bread. But the same people will look at you and say, crucify him. 
you will look at them they will say yes i ate your bread you will still die but there are a few others john stood by jesus on the cross mary stood by jesus if we perish let's perish but this one is our own we're standing with him can i tell you when especially for ministry if you've been in ministry for a while no matter how short a while it is you would have learned the pain of being left alone that the as a man of god if people only love you because you are anointed and because you're a sound preacher you are sitting on a time bomb they must love the version of you beyond the pulpit and love you for who you are there are men today let me tell you if they hear that certain people do not have food they will fly if need be bend over backwards and say not at my watch there are people today if they pass on to glory there are others who say their children are my responsibility until they become established now many believers do not know this respectfully speaking now i want to make a statement unbelievers especially muslims they understand this even greater than believers most believers are not relational they are only there for gallant days and glorious days job was the richest man in the east he had relatives he had brethren they all ran away from him the only person who stood by him was his precious wife and even her got tired one day and said curse god and die just die let's say diplomatic way to say listen this thing has eaten your body you've lost it just die it's a noble way just die so that at least i can rest but at least she stood by him my first prayer every time i teach on men is that you will be this kind of man I just described that you will be there for people there are a group of friends called friends for food they are only there when it is time to eat and when it is time to celebrate but I'm praying that you will not be such a person say amen, amen. there has to be somebody in your life that you love beyond the glitz and the glamour people who can count on you that if anybody leaves me crying not this brother not this pastor there are pastors who have had financial issues and everybody they had helped and built and labored or just waved them goodbye and say well, i bid you good speed be warm may god who you have always preached about come and rescue you and while the man is there with the wife and the children in pain crying and in the midst of all that betrayal and confusion here comes sincere people who will tell you i am here i never left why do we love the holy spirit so much because among so many things he's the friend that stick it closer than a brother he's called the comforter hallelujah you may have heard it in my teachings one of my life's goal aside being a preacher is that god will grant me the grace and the heart to be there for people at the moment when nobody else is there it is a very noble honor to be part of people's tears to be part of people's pain that someone can look at you today you can build a transgenerational blessing for your children and your children's children someone will look at you and say i will i don't know you you are a stubborn boy but your father did something in 1980 that will not make me forget you that man when i was crying before i became a permanent secretary or be before i became a man of god i was hungry and your father kept feeding me every month i lost my job for three years and your father took 20 percent of his salary and was giving me every day and i covenanted that i would look for his children and children's children and even though i don't like you as a person but your father's kindness to me is there any man in the house of Saul that I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? There are some of you right now, what you are doing for people, I don't mean to scare you, but it's your children that will suffer it. You are insulting everybody. You are not part of anybody's joy. One of the greatest ways to succeed is to look for people who God is helping and to partner with their rising your impact in the history of men let them remember you for what you did yesterday if you were not with me while I was farming let me not see you when I'm harvesting what are you doing there hallelujah 
The one who comes to join you famine is the one who believes that the harvest is coming. This is the reason why I made up my mind that as a man of God, younger ministers that God is helping and raising, no matter their tantrums and their childishness, I will not throw them away. It's better to make mistakes in our presence. Let's see it and correct them and manage them and help them. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because you throw them away based on the law of seasons, whether you like it or not, according to the time of life, one day there will be a decline. And the person who you said will not rise, when he now finally rises, he will rub it on your face and you will spend the remaining part of your life learning a painful lesson. Learn this. It is better to keep quiet than to look at people and tell them you are a failure. You may bite your finger in pain and regret. There are many people today who cannot rise and cannot remain because they pointed fingers at Jesus when they saw him in a manger and said, no, this cannot be Savior. Joseph had a dream. He saw the sun, moon, 11 stars bowing to him. And when he saw that, he told his brothers and the brothers said, you must be stupid, we'll kill you. We are not going to bow to you. Fast forward a few years later, here he comes, the prime minister of Egypt. They did not even know their brother again. And they came to bow. And he looked at them. He said, brothers, come and sit at table. It is the same me. They were afraid because they thought they were going to die. He said, no, you meant it for evil. But if within your evil, there was God's prophecy and God's plan. Hallelujah. You can't be there for everybody, but be there for somebody. Did you hear what I said? You can't be there for everybody. No. I would learn this lesson painfully by looking in a Catholic building and seeing a crucifix there. And it occurred to me for the first time that it was not my face that was there. You can't be there for everybody. Because there are people who can blackmail men of God and say, you were not there for me. No. We didn't die for your sins. We are witnesses pointing you to the one who died for your sins. Hallelujah. There are people who go around and sleep and then when they wake up, they stretch themselves and start ringing your number by 2 a.m., 3 a.m. and say, you promise to be there for us. And sometimes you can feel guilty and blackmailed as a man of God and say, okay, let me pick the call. No. If it's an emergency, go to the police station. I will help you. I love you. I will give my best, but you're not going to blackmail me emotionally. No. Jesus died. You can approach him directly. There is a new and living way. We are witnesses. So I'm not teaching you to just kill yourself. There are people who have run themselves to death. There are people who have gotten into all kinds of pain and problem simply because they want a reputation that is, is that, that the reputation of acceptance by everybody. No, that's not what I'm teaching you. But by all means, please be there for somebody. Be there for somebody. That someone may mean mama at home. That someone may mean your father at home. That someone may mean your brethren, your brothers. That someone may mean, oh, apostle, but do you know I'm a millionaire? Your millions does not count until we can trace how it made someone's life better. <laughs> Hallelujah. My God. Can I give you the last one? Listen, listen, listen. Do you know that all we have been saying was 0. 0.5? Okay, so number six now. Let me, let me leave five. We've done, we've done justice on five. You don't tell me thank you by saying thank you. Become a living epistle of this thing we're teaching. That is the greatest way to tell a man of God thank you. That hopefully by God's grace next year by this time, your life becomes so accelerated. You are so empowered and you can say thank God for the truths that I heard. That is the greatest way to tell a man of God thank you. But you see, most people who jump and shout in church are usually the ones who will not practice one of these kinds of things. Because the energy it takes to listen sometimes, we get very emotional and then we don't listen. And at the end of it, what did you gain? So, wow, it was just a powerful service. I hope you are not like that. Number six. Number six. I like Ghana. Hallelujah. 
Thank you. By the way, you have to teach me Ghana. You have to teach me. I, I know only two words. I know Akwaba. And then I know Medase. So I'm ready. I'm ready for the next lecture. So somebody, I, I need somebody. Some, you, somebody has got to teach me something. Hallelujah. Okay, number six, number six. Let's get to number six. What is the sixth level of light you must encounter? Maybe I'll just touch on that and then we'll come back in the evening and then we'll do justice. Um, I want to take the time to minister to people tonight. And so we'll be praying, be speaking over your life and we'll be imparting very mighty graces upon our lives tonight. Hallelujah. Right. You must know your adversary, the devil. The sixth level of light and knowledge you need to walk in dominion and to be empowered is that you must know your adversary, the devil. In all your knowledge, if you are ignorant of Satan nor the satanic kingdom, you will not excel. That is the truth. You must know your adversary, the devil. John chapter 10 and verse 10. John 10, 10. The Bible says, the thief cometh not, but for to steal, to kill and to destroy. A spirit that is characterized by these tripartite disasters is worth your knowledge. That any time you see Satan, you know his signature by stealing, killing and destruction. Jesus said, I am come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. Scripture number two. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. Please write these scriptures down. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. Be sober, he says. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, including Ghana, seeking whom he may devour. Verse 9. It says, whom resist steadfastly in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. He says to resist him. There is an adversary that is determined to thwart God's purpose in your life, your church, your ministry, your business, your family, your career, everything, your assignment and even your destiny. 1 John chapter 2 and 14. 1 John 2.14 1 John 2.14 I have written unto you fathers because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you young men because you are strong. Is that 14? Give us 14 please. Not 11, 14. Yes. And I have... Okay. And have the word of God abiding in you. Help me read the last statement. And ye have overcome the wicked one. Satan is not called the kind one. He's not called the friendly one. Those attributes are not with Satan. He's called the wicked one. Meaning when he sees a life. A father, a mother, a husband, a wife. When he sees a believer, all he's thinking about is how do I destroy this destiny? Can I give you one more scripture? 2 Corinthians 2.11 2 Corinthians 2.11 2 Corinthians 2.11 2 Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So Satan always searches for loopholes, loopholes in your spiritual understanding, loopholes in your consecration, loopholes around your life. That if the garrison of knowledge does not protect and preserve you, you can be a victim. And the Bible calls it an advantage unto him. And it says to not give Satan an advantage. That means he can find one. When Satan finds a hole, he will bore it until it becomes a door. There are many believers who are ignorant about Satan. Jesus did not teach that. When Jesus walked upon the earth, in his earth walk, he taught about Satan. He taught about demons. 
this is different from glorifying satan and demons giving believers spiritual intelligence to understand their adversary is an advantage for their victory it was jesus himself who taught that when a spirit leaves a man he goes through dry regions and not finding a place of safety it would tell itself let me return to my house He's still calling the man his house and he will gather seven other spirits greater than itself. They call Jesus Beelzebub that he was casting out demons by the prince of demons. And Jesus said, no, a kingdom divided itself against itself shall not stand. There were many things Jesus taught about Satan. He said, you are of the father, your father, the devil, because he was a murderer from the beginning. We never knew he was a murderer from the beginning. It was Jesus who told us and abided not in the truth in fact we never knew satan was a thief it was jesus that taught us that satan was a thief and that he comes to steal to kill and to destroy believers cannot afford to be ignorant as to who satan is if you must stand in your victory and establish your victory in christ you must understand the satanic kingdom Paul spoke to us and said, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. It was Paul that helped us to arrange this organogram of the satanic kingdom. When Jesus came to rebuke the spirit of the man in Gadara, the spirit came and he said, We are legion. That was where we learned that a legion of demons that the satanic kingdom even has an organized structure where one spirit can speak on behalf of the others. And they pleaded with Jesus and said, do not cast us out of this city. We have been here a long time. We have built our systems around this city. And Jesus said, go. And they left him and entered into swine. And people lost their businesses because one person was delivered. That one person became an evangelist. No wonder they looked for him to keep him down. They studied the destinies of men before afflicting them. The one you call the madman in Gadara was supposed to be the evangelist in Gadara. That was his destiny. So when Satan comes to Takoradi, he does not just look for everybody. There are certain people he wants to find because he knows that when he finds one person, it is equivalent to putting down 1,000 people as victims. Mm. Hallelujah. The teaching of Satan and demons should not end up glorifying Satan nor imparting fear in the saints. If you approach demonology from that standpoint, you are not accurate. So sometimes, um, and, and we preachers sometimes can be victims of this, we end up painting a picture that makes Satan look so invincible. We give such a, 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 an impression of intelligence and you know so many things. At the end of it, it's almost as if you want to be converted to now worship him because you are saying, a hey man who is this wise and powerful, what am I still doing here? That's not the idea. When you learn about accidents, it is for you to be an excellent driver. Nobody, if you teach people how to drive, among all the teachings, you must teach them. For drivers who become professional, there is a course on accidents. They literally study different kinds of accidents and how to be able to maneuver their ways. Pilots become captains because there are courses about disaster, air disaster management. You are not teaching the pilot because you want him to die. But it is that knowledge that makes him a professional pilot. Are we together now? So, we must approach the subject of demonology, deliverance, and the, the dark kingdom from a standpoint of an overall spiritual orientation that is supposed to empower the saints holistically. Don't just isolate Satan and give him an unusual credence and an unusual, at the end of it, believers are shaking, they are shivering in fear. And then sometimes we find pride that we've created a lot of mysticism and we've imparted fear. That's not Jesus' approach. He taught on Satan, but then they could stand tall in the victory. The Bible says, now thanks be to God, which causeth us always to triumph. Are we learning? But then to just throw it away and say, don't tell me about Satan. All I want to know is about Jesus. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, 
It's like saying, don't tell me about brakes. I don't need brakes. Not hand brakes, not even the one. Just, just show me how to accelerate. Sooner or later. Hmm. Hallelujah. Ignorance is not good. It is the reason why the house of God is a place of knowledge. Bethel, the place of bread. Where we are given the hallowed bread of the spirit man shall not live by bread alone there is another kind of life that we receive you live by bread your natural food but you live by light the word of god even in your spirit hallelujah listen to me your victory in christ becomes established when you truly understand who satan is and who demons are and then you know that they are not as indomitable as they propose to be. Not in light of what Christ has done. Not in light of the systems of advantage and the weapons of victory that have been given to us. It was Paul who took out time to mentor the church in Ephesus. And when he was done teaching them about everything, he now taught them something called the whole armor of God. Is that in your Bible? And he, with the intelligence the intelligence of an intellectual he began to paint pictures of a warrior the breastplate of righteousness he says the helmet of salvation your feet shod together with the gospel of peace and holding the sword of the spirit and the shield of faith he says wherein ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts and haven't done all to stand he says stand now you are a warrior you would notice there was no shield for your back because with that kind of armory, there is no turning back. Hallelujah. Tonight, we're going to be experiencing the triumph of light over darkness. There are many people who have come for this conference and are coming tonight oppressed, coming with all kinds of plagues of darkness. This is the knowledge that has empowered us to be able to tell the nations come together we have something of divine quality to serve you it will be pride to gather people and claim to know god and claim to talk to them and claim he can bless he can lift he can heal and deliver where is your confidence standing on this is the light the knowledge of god the knowledge of yourself let's do a quick recap number three the knowledge of your prophetic place in life and destiny. Elisha knew this so much. He told the king, he said, send Naaman. Let him know that there is a prophet in Israel, not a messenger in Israel. He knew he was a prophet of God in Israel. This was not just an acclamation of status for the sake of ego. That after this conference, we can say there is a businessman in Ghana. There is an apostle in Ghana. There is a prophet in Ghana. There is an evangelist in Ghana. There is a church in Ghana. There are believers in Ghana. There are businessmen. There are politicians in Ghana. There are people of influence. Because you know, you know. I'm walking in power. I walk in miracles. I live a life of favor. I know who I am. That's what I wanted you to hear. You need to know who you are in light of who Christ is. Then to know your place in destiny, it gives you security. Your honor is in your assignment. Your prosperity is in your assignment. Your relevance is in your assignment. It is frustrating to teach a fish how to fly. No matter how obedient that fish is, it will be a poor student. Leave it in the water. And you see the inbuilt creativity. There are birds that can come from long distances in the air and come and pick a fish. But they cannot remain in the ocean for a long time. As great as man is, we've learned how to swim. We've learned how to fly. But our place of habitation is the earth. We don't swim forever and we don't fly. <laughs> Excuse me. We don't fly forever. When you find a man flying forever, he will eventually die. He will die of fatigue. When you find a man swimming forever, he will eventually drown. Are we together? We can fly, 
we can swim we can move by the sea but land is the place of our habitation so don't try to judge a fish by its ability to fly you'll be making a mistake you throw the fish up and it helplessly comes down but the genius and the creativity of that fish is when it is at sea hallelujah find your place and then to understand the mysteries of the kingdom number four the modus operandi of the kingdom the fifth kind of light that I've taught you is to understand man as the zenith of God's creation. And then finally, to know your adversary, the devil. And to know the victory that has been given to you against him. He says, behold, I give you power against. Power against. There are several kinds of power. The first one we see revealed to the saints in the Bible is power to become. As many as believed in him, he gave them power to become. There is power to become. That is for your translation and transformation. There is power against. Hallelujah. I think we should stop here and pray. This is good for the morning. Rise up on your feet. Hold hands with someone by your left and right if you can. I want us to pray together. Hold hands with someone by your left and right. In the next one minute, I want us to pray in the spirit together as a family of faith, holding hands together and you are praying in the spirit and then I'll give you two prayer points and we're done for the morning. Go ahead and pray. You don't need to know the person whose hand you are holding. All you need to know is that he loves Jesus. And he came for this international prophetic gathering to rise, to become great, to excel, to manifest as a witness and as an ambassador. Go ahead and pray. The next one minute, we are praying in the spirit with dedicated focus on Jesus, dedicated focus on your destiny as you pray i like you to see the new you rising the anointed you rising the enlightened you rising the empowered you rising shabaka paruska labarenta fereketo samyash sasha balashka balaka paratosen shabranda gebereketosh Legra kata parakata fresca de belenda pa sobros kodoba la kata. A few more seconds. Pray. Saba la kata shafraska de beleketa. spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat the resurrected king is resurrecting me by your spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat the resurrected king is resurrecting me the resurrected king is resurrecting Prayer point number one. You are going to pray and say, Holy Spirit, I yield myself. I yield my faculties. Take me to a dimension of empowerment through light. 
that where I am, the realm of darkness or limited revelation that has kept me, Jesus said, when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. Now you're going to cry and say, Holy Spirit, I yield myself. Take me on a journey in the spirit, a journey of enlightenment. Someone is praying. A journey of enlightenment. Enlightenment through scripture. An impartation of the spirit of revelation. Take me on a journey, spirit of the living God. You're a man of God. Pray that prayer. A journey in the spirit. Higher realms. Greater dimensions of light. Illumination. Power. That gives stature and stability to my life. in Jesus name in Jesus name final prayer point father the next level of my prophetic destiny let it be opened unto me in this conference go ahead and pray the next level for some of you, you have come to the end of a season. That's why God brought you here. But you must know the next season you are to step in. No assumptions. No assumptions. No assumptions. No assumptions. Is someone praying? Cry to the Lord. Let it be from the depth of your heart. I sense that many people are coming to an end. Of a very strange season in their life you must know when seasons come to an end and you must know when new prophetic horizons are being opened and of the sons of Issachar men who had an understanding of the times and they knew what Israel ought to do the next level of my music ministry the next level in business the next level in the church, the ministry, the apostolic and prophetic platform, the prayer group, the next level. Let me not camp around yesterday, whereas the spirit has moved to new heights, new planes in the spirit. Job said there is a path which no fowl has seen. The whelps of the lion has not trodden. In Jesus' matchless name we have prayed. In Jesus' matchless name we have prayed. Amen. There are many things that the Lord is going to be doing for us tonight. Number one, he will grant us access to light again. There is something I want to show you this night by the spirit of the living God. And then we are going to trust God for grace to pray come tonight prepared to pray i hope you love to pray he spake a parable to the end that men ought always to pray and not to faint we will trust god for grace to build stamina in the spirit as we pray under the corporate anointing and then we'll trust the holy spirit to reach down with his might and power and to bring breakthroughs deliverances i trust god with you that someone tonight will come here and certain circles, certain patterns, certain age-long captivities that may have defied your prayer, your fasting. God has sent us by the privilege of the election of grace with the rod of the higher priesthood to bring an end to some of these oppressions. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, the Bible declares, with the Holy Ghost and with power. He went about doing good, healing all they that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. 
and then I think the high point of tonight's meeting is the impartation please do not miss it and for those who are following online you can invite all your friends and your loved ones perhaps you are a pastor who may not have had the honor and the opportunity to fly into Ghana you may be following from any part of the world Europe America Asia even here in Africa or here in Ghana you can connect impartation is a powerful mystery I'm going to be showing you tonight is a spiritual system by which men access foreign graces to their lives and with it they are empowered to do more to be relevant even within this prophetic season but for now I declare that the Lord bless you may the hand of the Almighty rest upon you in the name of Jesus that between now and the evening session I pray that God will stir a hunger within your heart that your appetite for spiritual things for accurate knowledge will be so heightened and for many of you even before the evening the hello scriptures exhort us from the book of proverbs it says my son attend to my sins incline thy ears to my words let them not depart from thy eyes and keep them in the midst of thee as you have listened to this message we believe that you are going to reap the blessings thereof if you attend to these words as well that you will keep these words in the midst of your heart that no matter the circumstance your eyes are going to be fixed on these words and as you have been blessed we will tell you to share this message be an evangelist by sharing to others to be blessed and then subscribe to this channel for us because we have loads of videos we have loads of content that is going to make you blessed that is going to set you on course that is going to set you ablaze and don't forget to like for us thank you